Hello, everyone, and welcome in the last day of ScreenShake. We are happy to have you here. And we want to introduce to you Mitu Kandaker, who will talk about feelings. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming to the first talk on the second day uh, of the conference, the morning after the party. Um, just to sort of get you started gently, um, I know there's probably a few sore heads around. Let's just take a um, couple cool minutes just to uh, watch and listen to some birds. Okay, um, so I love that installation, but we'll come back to that later. Um, so thank you uh, so much uh, to all of you for coming, uh, and thank you to the organisers for, uh, for having me here. Um, so I was told um, when I was invited to speak that the theme of the conference this year um, is the idea of uh, the author and the way that people express themselves through their games. Um, and we've certainly seen that celebrated here uh, so far uh, in all kinds of, of different ways. Um, so my talk today is entitled uh, Feelings and Other Such Maths, uh, and it's a talk about generative aesthetics and personal expression. I, so I have to admit, because when I heard the theme being about authorship, I kind of felt a little bit like a fraud, because... The kind of game developer that I am, the way that I design games, doesn't necessarily fit that description. Um, I design primarily simulation games uh, and social simulation games at that. Uh, and this talk is really just about what it means for me to express myself through my games uh, and who the author is and why I feel like there's a certain kind of, a certain kind of joy in that uncertainty. Um, after all, it's no secret that there are all these wonderful developers and artists out there making these really beautiful, really explicitly personal uh, and expressive games about their own experiences, giving us these playful mean means through which to explore, reaffirm and find solace in the familiar, or for perspectives which they might be reflecting different from our own, a new lens through which we can interrogate the unfamiliar. Um, so, as Lana Polanski so brilliantly and eloquently uh, taught us yesterday, art games are as old as games, right? People have been making uh, alternative, expressive games for a long, long time. Um, and I'm, but I'm also pleased that, um, especially in the last decade, uh, because of the fact it's been so easy to do so and the impetus to do so, um, has reached this even wider audience of developers, right? There are even more makers than ever before, which is really, uh, really amazing. Um, so three from uh, games primarily based around Twine, like Anna Anthropy's Oh My God, Are You All Right? about the real actual time that Anna was knocked over by a car and taken to hospital, or Cara Ellison's Sacrilege, exploring sex and uncertainty. Or Laura Dreamfield's Curtain, exploring abusive relationships. Or Nina Freeman's Sybil, a game about an MMO-based romance, a story which is intensely and overtly autobiographical. Um, so here are a few more games I found on Itch earlier, uh, examples of very deeply uh, sort of expressive and personal games. Um, the first one on the left there is Ambivalence by Maddie Hoberg, uh, which is a game about the complex feelings that come with new motherhood. Uh, and the one on the right is She Who Fights Monsters by a developer called Gaming Pixie. Um, and it's an experience about, uh, it's a game about dealing with her father's alcoholism. 
Um, there have been slightly higher profile ones as well. So, um, you know, and such games can also be a kind of catharsis for, the, for its creators, right? Games which help the creator deal with uh, deep personal losses and grieving over the closest loved ones. Um, so there's That Dragon Cancer, and I believe the movie to do with that is screening here tonight. Um, even through to Kanye West's recently announced game about his late mother, right? Finding her way to heaven. Like the idea of uh, games as being deeply personal and expressive is, um, is, is like even more popular than before. So we've often talked about games being this kind of conversation between the creator and the player, right? Um, a designer crafts an interactive system that aims to communicate some sort of meaning to the player, and the player discovers their own interpretation of that meaning by interacting with the system. The game is kind of a dialogue strictly between the player and the designer, and the medium itself is kind of an intermediary for that conversation. The medium is basically a medium, right? Um, so all of those games express something about their creator's inner lives, uh, and there is something incredibly brave about that, the courage needed in order to, uh, in order to address that kind of vulnerability. Um, and in doing so, those games are designed to communicate something highly specific and highly uh, predefined by the creator so they can best express their experience. Um, so basically, when confronted with doing this talk, I started wondering and worrying about my, my voice as an author, given the kinds of games I'm interested in making, right? Um, so just to backtrack, so um, uh, the, the, the main game that you may or may not have heard of uh, that I've made uh, a couple of years ago was called Red Shirt. Um, if you've seen or played it so far, it looks a bit, a bit like this, uh, but now it's about to look like this because I'm about to do like a, a, an updated re-release. Um, so Red Shirt is basically a social networking on a space station simulator uh, in which players take on the role of this uh, lowly janitor on this, uh, on this space station and you're trying to work your way up the career and social ladders using um, this thing called Spacebook, which is a simulated, the simulated social network which everyone uses. And you interact with the other AI-driven characters on board by exclusively using the actions that are available to you through that interface. Uh, things like posting updates, liking each other's updates, messaging each other, and so forth. Um, it's possible to play completely nicely when you're playing Red Shirt, of course. You can work on your skills and apply for promotions while trying to keep a healthy work-life balance by making friends and keeping a good social support system. However, it's also possible to play transgressively too. In fact, my favorite stories from players are when they recount how they tried to play the game nicely, uh, but instead found themselves behaving in all these accidentally Machiavellian ways, uh, kind of just as a reaction to the NPC behaviors that they were confronted with, right? The ways that the NPCs in the game chose to act. Um, so basically, the kind of uh, expressive personal communication I'm particularly interested in doing through games is one which kind of includes the machine itself, right, as another agent of expression beyond just the creator and the player. The machine is this kind of third participant in this playful conversation, contributing to it equally with whatever it's decided to be the most appropriate. In this way, we can see the computer as a kind of expressive artist too, making its decisions via this sort of algorithmic serendipity. Speaking of serendipity, um, so this is a poster from a 1968 exhibition called Cybernetic Serendipity, which was the first ever exhibition uh, in the world of generative machine art. Uh, so it was held in London at the Institute of Contemporary Art. Um, and it, promoted the work of these pioneering computer artists at the time who used the medium of the computer or the machine in order to respond to external inputs uh, from people or from the environment and react accordingly, often in unforeseen or expected ways. Um, and it ran a full range of types of, uh, types of installations. So the one on the left there is uh, SAM, Sound Activated Mobile, which was the first uh, moving sculpture which moved directly and recognizably in response to uh, people walking around it. So it basically just had uh, four microphones and, um, and it would basically just move in the direction of uh, whichever one got activated. Um, the one on the right, actually, there's a small video uh, which I can play to do with that. So this is the, um, the Honeywell Emmett Forget-Me-Not computer.
Just, you know, building a computer out of bones and stuff. It's fine. So I'll stop it there. Um, but yeah, it's bonkers. I love it. The power? Oh, okay. I don't think I've got any more audio, so we should be good. But is that still buzzing now? No? Okay. Cool. Um, okay, so um, yeah, there were all kinds, of, all kinds of weird and wonderful installations. Um, there was also a book which is produced to accompany the exhibition. Um, and I also really love that it came with this really wonderful glossary, uh, giving definitions of words like online or programming language or software. Uh, one of my favorite definitions in the glossary is this really eccentric listing for simulation, uh, which is communicated via means of a limerick. Uh, so it says, the coach on the blackboard did scrawl his trickiest play of the fall. Through his simulation, though his simulation drew quite an ovation, the quarterback fumbled the ball. Um, which is kind of a sensible definition, right? Uh, it's conveying the necessity of executing uh, a kind of representation on this like blackboard that the, this football team coach has drawn. Um, and you know, it's conveying the idea of simulations being process-based representations, right? Representations which unfold over time. Um, so the press release for this, uh, for this exhibition also recounted uh, a brief etymology of the word serendipity, right, which is what I was trying to get to. Um, and it refers to this old Persian fairy tale about the three princes of Serendip, which was the old name for Sri Lanka, um, who used to travel throughout the world and uh, whatever it was they were looking for, they would also always stumble upon something even better. Um, so it was actually used, uh, it was, you know, the word serendipity was first used by Horace Walpole in 1754 to sort of describe that experience of making happy chance discoveries. Um, and it was that idea of serendipitous findings which what often drew in those computer artists, right? They would talk of the excitement when a program took on a life of its own uh, as the image kind of emerged out of nothing. They continually talked about the thrill of finding unexpected possibilities. Um, and one of them said, um, even though my work process is rational and systematic, its results can be unpredictable. Like a journey, only the starting point and a hypothetical destination are known. What happens during the journey is often unexpected and surprising. And, um, and so to further underscore uh, that point, the exhibition material also stated, uh, through the use of cybernetic devices to make graphics, film, and poems, as well as many other, uh, other randomizing machines which interact with the spectator, many happy discoveries were made, hence the title of the exhibition. Um, and this idea of uh, randomness is one that I want to sort of touch on. Um, this is Gaussian Quadratic, um, which was another piece of computer art from 1963 by Michael Knoll, um, who was another computer art practitioner, although he didn't like the term. Uh, Noll tried to copyright this image, um, but his application was rejected on the grounds that a machine generated the artwork, or generated the work. Um, so Noll tried to explain to them that actually a human being had written the program, um, and it's a program that incorporated randomness in order, uh, but it was still rejected. They still didn't accept that, uh, that, definite, that explanation. Um, and it was only when uh, Michael Knoll uh, explained that actually it only seemed random, but it was actually the result of specifically written maths equations that the copyright was accepted. Um, 
And maths is obviously and inextricably woven into every layer of computer art, of course. Um, so uh, Grant D. Taylor uh, has written this excellent sort of written history of computer art. Um, he recounts other periods uh, where the interrelation of maths and art has, has been particularly sort of salient. Um, one of them was during the Renaissance, of course, uh, and the use of maths to figure out perspective and divide up pictorial space. Um, but here was art in which uh, art which was very explicitly um, in which maths was very explicitly foregrounded, right? Um, and it was foregrounded for the practitioners too. In fact, many of the practitioners specifically sought to distance themselves from their art so that the abstract world of maths combined with the autonomous nature of the machine was what distanced them. And there were lots of commonalities between that practice of computer art um, with the conceptual art movement as well in that way. Um, for instance, the art of Sol LeWitt was, um, was uh, you know, one of the examples was a set of these uh, algorithmic procedures um, because he was a, a, yeah, one of the sort of important people in conceptual art uh, who believed that the idea itself could be, could be the work of art, right? Uh, and he maintained that like sort of an architect who designs the plans for a building and then you give it to a contractor to build, that's the way that uh, an artist should be able to come up with artwork as well. Uh, you know, actually give you instructions for how to design the art and then have somebody else go and reproduce it. Um, so in conceptual art, there's the idea, and, and in computer art, of course, there's this, there's this idea of the suppression of authorial presence. Uh, there's this decoupling of the relationship between the art and the art object, uh, achieved through sort of mitigating all signs of personal invention and outsourcing the creative process to the machine. <clears throat> and um, uh, so this is a quote from uh, Sol LeWitt, um, and he said, art is not about making choices. It's in making an initial, uh, it's, in, it's in making an initial choice of say a system and letting the system do the work. All the planning and decisions are made beforehand and the execution is a perfunctory affair. Um, so, you know, you can apply that model to something even like a wind chime, right? Um, and lots of types of objects. Uh, like they're designed objects, a wind chime is a designed object. You're setting the starting conditions based on how you're designing the, the thing, how long the tubes are, how many there are, etc. And then waiting to harness the apparent randomness um, uh, of the wind, which is actually not random, it's actually part of a very intricate weather system, right? Um, or a better example to go back to the video of birds that, that you watched earlier. So that was from an installation by uh, artist Celeste uh, Borsier-Mougenot. And as the artist, all he's doing is basically creating this set of starting conditions, right? He's created the environment necessary for that experience to take place. Um, but so he was the one tuning the guitars and placing them in the room. Uh, he's, he's basically the one setting the reference frame, um, but the finches are the ones executing the piece. Um, and the finches, like, there were 70 finches in that installation, um, and they aren't applying volition, and they're not trying to express anything specific, they're just doing what finches do. Um, the gestalt of all the finches is the thing that's creating that particular aesthetic experience in that work. Um, and the kind of resulting aesthetic is kind of arrhythmic, but it's not atonal, right? Um, the artist tuned all the instruments before he started, so they still produce pleasing tones. But the rhythm and order of the notes uh, is defined by the way that the birds happen to want to behave. So if we transpose that thinking to computer-based generative work, um, so the physical space in that installation and the instruments are really these sort of algorithmic definitions that the creator sets up, right? That someone like me would set up. Um, and the randomizing component, uh, the computer, is the birds, right? So. In this scenario, birds are basically computers, so I hope that clears that up. I hope one or two of you got that reference. Um, okay, so there's this collaborative, generative aesthetic uh, between a human being and a non-human system. Um, so are computers special then in that regard? Well, no, not really. Um, but, I mean, they are kind of because, um, because just of the additional power that computation gives us, right? Um, uh, they're sort of the, or they can be the ultimate expression of a generative system and what it's capable of, um, because it just means that you can define more complex starting systems. Uh, but other than that, the joy of discovery through designed, explicitly designed 
randomness is still the same. The most mainstream example of sort of that kind of generative aesthetic in terms of narrative in, uh, in games is hardcore simulation games, right? So things like Dwarf Fortress, um, simulation so detailed that it couldn't be authored or accounted for. Um, and it's along those sort of similar lines that, um, that, that Red Shirt sought to operate. Um, so uh, just to sort of talk a little bit about the starting conditions that I set in that particular game, um, because I get, as I said, that it was the behavior of the NPCs that really drove that, that experience. Um, and it was really important in order to, uh, it was important to allow for enough complexity um, for unexpected events to take place, but constrained enough that I could shape the possibility space. Um, so, you know, the NPCs had all these fixed, fixed attributes, um, like five main fixed attributes, bigotry, chattiness, vanity, quirkiness, and fickleness. And like those say something, right, about uh, this sort of dystopian future of social interaction, which, uh, which I'm trying to reflect on this space station. Um, like the, 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 the variables are, are, are expressive, I hope, um, but there's also, uh, but they also interact with these other fluid attributes and the NPCs can, uh, can, can modify each other's attributes through interaction. So all these unexpected things stem from these very explicitly constrained uh, starting, uh, starting points. Um, and, and the other thing I wanna sort of note is that the more complex a simulation, the greater the machine's role the, and the smaller your role in some ways. Um, and, you know, and, and, and you can sort of play with that for the uh, possibility of different types of expression. Um, so, you know, so that's a little bit about what I was trying to express through Redshirt and my motivation for sort of making it a generative experience. Um, it explicitly limits the system because it's a game kind of about this sort of dystopian, uh, well, it's a game about ambition in many ways, whether that's related to money or career or social ambition. Um, but within those design constraints, anything can happen. Um, so this is just a list of all the things that any given NPC or indeed the player can take. Um, and of course, like every game, what I really want to underscore is that this is a distilled and conscientiously reduced model of the world, right? Algorithms are never neutral, they are expressive, and that's, uh, I, I feel like that's doubly true of social simulation in which you're sort of trying to reduce the, the, the co uh, complex and messy human world into, uh, into systems. Um, so uh, this, was just, uh, this was just a snippet of how love worked in Red Shirt, um, which actually I, I put this up here because it has the most uh, sort of randomness to it because um, it's also because I did a lot, of, uh, a lot of soul searching about how would you model love in a game like this? Um, and so, you know, there's all these, and there's all these checks that take place, like do you have the same interests? Uh, do you have compatible sexual orientations? Um, and then ultimately it's kind of like a dice roll because it's all very mysterious. Um, but, um, but yeah, but you know, um, but these things kind of work for the player because it's kind of open to, um, it's open to the sort of the player's interpretation, right? The player's interpretation of that randomness, which is interesting, which is a thing I'll come back to later. Um, so I designed Redshirt as this generative experience, um, the inherent, uh, because I was just interested in the sort of inherent, well, interestingness of those experiences. And I wanted to make sure that these unexpected moments would just emerge for the player, right? And for me as well, um, as someone watching a player or hearing their stories about what they did in the game. Um, and the systems, as I said, they still spoke for me, right? But they also kind of spoke for the computer in some ways and for the player in this kind of three-way collaborative process of the simulation unfolding. Um, so I wanted to have an authorial voice, uh, but I also wanted the, to let the player happen upon things too, that idea of serendipity. Um, so the idea of computer art uh, was, uh, you know, I have to say, uniformly dismissed, right? Uh, uh, especially when it, when it first sort of uh, emerged, like the, uh, the, the exhibition Cer uh, Cybernetic Serendipity. Um, it was kind of widely panned, um, especially by the art world, right? Because computers were thought of as um, these sort of, you know, capitalistic soulless things, the very symbol of the thing that artists sought to eman emancipate us from, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
This is a quote from uh, Jean Hayes Beeman, who was one of the um, exhibitors in the, uh, in, in the exhibition. Uh, and she said, most of us do not even want a machine of any kind to succeed in conceiving any art form at all. The arts are usually presented as our last refuge from the onslaughts of our whole machine civilization with its attendant pressures towards squeezing us into the straitjacket of the organized man. Um, and in some ways, you know, the concerns that people had were warranted, right? So cybernetic serendipity, uh, as wonderful and quirky as it seems, it was sponsored by the US Air Force. Uh, and it was that that brought to bear some of the sort of tensions between artists and scientists. Uh, while scientists were used to sort of big government grants, uh, artists weren't. And that was one of the vectors, the, one of the many vectors of the tensions between the sort of two worlds. Um, the most positive, even the most positive of articles uh, in the New York Times expressed regret that the future would be uh, entrusted to the deus ex machina. People would be rendered obsolete and, and remain only as a servant to the computer artist. Uh, and scientists, so you know, scientists making computer art were seen as being reductionist, reducing art to code. Um, and, you know, and, and lots of people also criticized uh, both computer art and conceptualism for emptying art of subjective content, removing any signs of the artist um, such that anyone could have made it. Um, even, uh, you know, so, so basically lots of people thought that uh, conceptual art, computer art was emotionally dry. Um, and, you know, those, those same uh, criticisms were leveled towards the machine as well. Except I would argue that sort of creativity of a computer isn't a, it's, well, it is a, it's a unique phenomenon, right? Creativity of a computer is a unique phenomenon uh, with its own very particular aesthetic. Uh, and its goal isn't to replicate human creativity, uh, nor can it be replicated by a human, not to the same effect. Um, and, you know, and there's a certain kind of charm to the things that a computer comes up with, right? Um, given the sort of explicitly uh, design systems uh, of, the, uh, of the computer artist. Um, and far from being cold or lifeless as well, some creators have harnessed the sort of particular, uh, the, the, the particular nature of the sort of generative aesthetic for comedic effect, um, taking advantage of the particular properties of computational creativity. Um, so I'm gonna play another short video. This is something you may or may not be uh, familiar with. Um, so these are machine generated TED Talks uh, by Samim uh, and by the computer. Uh, so the way that this works is by having, uh, having this system read the transcript of like 2,000 different TED Talks uh, and then modeling what a TED Talk does. So I'm just going to play a couple of minutes of this because it's just amazing. So the system also decides when to generate the laughter. pretty convincing, right? Um, okay, so, oh, oh no, I've got my presentation. Um, okay, so 
None of the things that, uh, so basically one of the things that I really appreciate uh, about the computational com uh, comedy work by Samim that I just showed you um, is that it's kind of doing the work of exposing generative systems and what they do to kind of the wider public, right? It's doing the work through comedy of demystifying what computers do and bringing the sort of peculiar joy, that serendipitous joy of the generative aesthetic to the public. Um, as I mentioned, the most mainstream example of, um, of, of games which do that uh, are sort of hardcore simulation games, um, Dwarf Fortress, etc. Um, but, you know, the problem is that a lot of these games are thought of as being hardcore, right? Like a lot of the, as much as I sort of hate that dichotomy, um, a lot of games uh, which do these kinds of things require this very deep systems literacy. Um, and it's a problem because, you know, those games are perceived as being hardcore. Um, and so when we, and, you know, it means there's lots of ingrained assumptions to overcome, um, especially if you're trying to communicate what, uh, what, a, what a generative system does to, uh, to people who don't, uh, who maybe don't have that same level of systems literacy. Um, and it's a problem of education, right? Um, but it's a difficult one. Because... And yeah, and I feel like it's a shame because one of the enduring pleasures of playing games um, for me, from a personal perspective, is kind of the stories that get, that get generated while we're playing a game. And I don't mean like actually within the game or the plot of the game or, it or whatever, but the sort of story that comes into existence as a result of the game being played. Um, there are unique stories that are crafted between you and your friends or between you and the system or you with yourself, no matter why else you may be playing the game. Um, and so, yeah, to me, playing games and the beauty of playing games has always been about uh, the stories that, that kind of emerge from them. And I suppose a large part of my interest in these kinds of games is in sharing the opportunity for, for an authorial voice with the player, uh, helping the player to understand that their interaction with these systems is its own kind of authorship. Um, so I'm now working on a game which kind of seeks to emphasize that relationship. Um, so this is uh, an older screenshot from um, Little Invasion Stories. Um, and it's, uh, it's a sort of casual, well, city building game, funnily enough. Um, and it's also, but it's a, a city building game around uh, people and their relationships. Um, so you have all these citizens uh, who are these sort of social agents and they uh, interact with each other and they fall out with each other. And it's your job to make sure that they're happy and you're providing for them. Um, and you're also uh, protecting them from these various bouts of alien invasion, as you do. Um, but it's a game uh, designed to also formalize the process of narrativizing the generative aesthetic to make it more accessible. Uh, the mechanical interactions that kind of take place in the game um, are also narrated through text, right? Um, so for example, um, you know, you might have just, in the screenshot, you just built a house. So it says the two bedroom house was built, how the people rejoiced. And then uh, one of the NPCs is saying, oh great, aliens again. Um, so, it's basically a game that tries its hand through, uh, tries its hand at sort of really um, foregrounding what happens when we play, uh, when we when we play like a procedural game, right? Um, and it's it's still it's still a work in progress at the moment, but the idea is that the game is doing the thing that systems literate players do in their heads or on forums when they play a complex simulation. Um, so taking the output of their, their otherwise very systems-y game and writing it up as a story. Um, it's, in a way, it's kind of like the phenomenon of, uh, of things like Boat Murdered, like uh, from Dwarf Fortress, right? Uh, or, or Oil Furnace, which I've got a picture of here, but distilled into an accessible game. Um, and because all of that is kind of something we're predisposed to doing anyway. We're very good at filling in the logical and narrative gaps for anything that we come across. It's kind of this weird thing that our brains do. Um, an instance of this is, of course, called the ELISA effect, which you might be familiar with by um, Joseph Weizenbaum, uh, who created the ELISA chatbot. Um, and even though ELISA, and I'm sure lots of you have interacted with it before, it's this very dumb chatbot, right? Like, it doesn't have any intelligence. It basically just repeats back to you plenty, uh, it repeats back to you strings that you've said before. Um, but... And it know, you know, so it knows nothing about human interaction. Um, it knows nothing uh, about about anything really. Um, but people still attributed to Eliza much more sentience, much more volition than it actually had. 
Um, so Weizenbaum concluded that computers can, as he said, induce powerful delusional thinking in quite normal people. We're predisposed to filling in the gaps in a system uh, that we come across. Um, and I think there's something inherently lovely about that, about our tendency to kind of find meaning where there is none. Um, so I'm going to just sort of change tack slightly just as I sort of wrap up. Um, and because I really want to kind of underscore that I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that generative expressive games are better than games which privilege the author. Like, I'm really not saying that because I really do admire people um, who put their own stories out there. Um, and I think it's incredibly brave in a way that I'm really not, I suppose, um, or at least felt like I couldn't be for a number of reasons. Um, and I just so happen as a creator to feel much more comfortable uh, making games in which my co-author is the computer that are mediated by uh, this sort of, this, this idea of distance. Um, but in some ways, the reason I've set all this up is because this is, this is secretly a very personal talk about this subject, because I, I used to make games like that, like the, the sort of latter kind of games. I used to make those myself for a time, um, and I used to design very, very personal games, um, let's say game sketches that I wanted to express, but for the most part, I didn't tell anyone or show anyone. Um, so I'm gonna show you an embarrassing screenshot from 2008, um, which was the secret blog I kept uh, called 8-Bit Confessional, very silly and emo, uh, emo title. Um, and, and I actually just found this again through the Wayback Machine, because on reflecting and writing this, I was like, huh, I wonder what, it, what happened to it. It kind of got lost to the ages. Um, and uh, all that came up on the Wayback Machine on the Wayback Machine was this first post in which I was explaining my motivations um, for starting this blog, which was that I wanted to communicate um, through games personal experiences like growing up and uh, and also love and heartbreak. For me, there was a problem though. Um, so I actually come from a moderately traditional uh, sort of South Asian family background and I grew up with a similar set of struggles uh, to what a lot of people from a similar background um, also struggle with, which is definitely not expressing their personal lives uh, in public uh, and keeping, having to keep things uh, sort of hidden from, uh, from like a, your wider, your sort of family and their community, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I kept this project secret, um, which is all very well and good because they are actually very terrible games that I made. Um, I did, uh, the couple that I did release publicly um, were ones in which I was trying to be deliberately obtuse. So you kind of could interact with the game, but you couldn't really tell what it was about, like on purpose, um, which is pretty much a recipe for disaster when it comes to uh, expressive game design. Um, but the reason I'm talking about this is to really underscore the fact that the identity of creators matters in so many ways. Um, now, my love of, intro, my love of uh, generative, uh, expressive games comes from just that interest in the beauty of emergence and, and, uh, and what that can do. But I suppose, without trying to psychoanalyze myself too much, um, maybe that's why that kind of distancing became important to me, uh, like moving beyond this sort of explicitly personal message to this larger one um, created through collaboration with the player and the machine. After all, Redshirt is uh, ostensibly a game about relationships, right? Um, but it, you'll notice it's not a game about my relationships, it's about yours, the players, uh, but seen through those systems that I've crafted as a personal expression of what those, <clears throat> what those relationships might mean and letting you explore that in this uh, playful way. Um, and I think it's uh, exactly that tendency um, that, that we have to sort of discern meaning from, from uh, from these sort of random systems that so so interesting. Um, so as I examined earlier, the, the criticism gets leveled towards uh, com computational art that it's cold or unfeeling. But I think that, um, you know, and, and the criticism that they have, that art which is generative has nothing to teach us, right? Nothing to teach us about our humanity or whatever. Um, but I think it's actually about moving towards a different kind of truth. Uh, one in which you, the creator, can uh, can also look for serendipitous truths alongside uh, alongside the player. And really, 
I think the, you know, it, the, the beauty of generative art is this need we have to find uh, meaning in, in nothingness, right? And it's a lovely reminder of our brain's tendency to do just that, to try to understand ourselves and each other when very little else makes sense. I think that's kind of probably why I have this particular interest in uh, social simulation games. Uh, it's just what we do as humans. Our brains love to find patterns in randomness. Um, and I think so. I think the, the opposite is true. I think uh, as opposed to being devoid of humanity, the, these finding meaning in things like that is actually one of the most universally human things we can do. Um, one of my favourite uh, quotes, things ever, uh, is a talk by. Um, it's from a talk by comic book writer and, and actual wizard uh, Alan Moore. Um, entitled Snakes and Ladders, which was a talk that he gave at a magic convention, of all things, uh, on trying to understand what is real, uh, let alone what is magic. Uh, and he says that we humans are the mud that sat up, that through us the universe knows itself, loves itself, and breaks its own heart. And really, that's a big reason um, why I make games. It's a big part of the reason why I make games, to better understand who we are and how we should best treat each other. So to me, that's kind of my, uh, my wandering look at sort of my version of authorship in games, of expressing ideas through setting up those starting conditions, those, uh, those specifically imbued uh, simulation uh, algorithms. And, you know, I'm the one putting in those symbols and guitars in the right places uh, and just letting the birds loose. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone.